everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Hello, my darlings. Lovely to see you all. Today, I thought we'd do a bit of time traveling. I wanted to go forward to January 2025 to see if I could stand in that energy in the US and get the vibe of the place. See how everybody's feeling, see how America is feeling once the 2024 election is over. Uh, the pictures were incredibly interesting. Also, I wanted to find out if Jack Smith is interested in the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. If he, as we're told, Mike Johnson, was so incredibly involved in the setting up of the overthrowing of the 2020 election, then shouldn't Jack Smith be looking at him and maybe considering an indictment? I thought I'd take a look at that. Plus, Pat Harrigan. You may never have heard of Pat Harrigan, but he's an ex-soldier, a former Green Beret, actually, who is now running in North Carolina. Really, just one more soldier running for office, which kind of bolsters up my theory about the 2024 election. So I'll see whether he stands a chance of being elected. Uh, plus a whole bunch more. <laughs> Welcome to the new subscribers. I always say this now. Welcome to the new subscribers. It's lovely to see you. Thank you to everybody who bought a mug or a t-shirt this week from the shop. I uh, greatly appreciate it. And also thank you to everybody who left a comment, uh, both on this channel and on the Enlightened Beings Club channel. If ever you find that there are no videos on this channel at any particular time, it may be because I'm on the other channel doing videos for there and mixing it up uh, with my other favorite peeps. Uh, speaking of which, there is a new video on there testing out breakfast cereals. That was really interesting. I'll put a link to it in the show notes below this video, but if you want to wander over there and see that, that's uh, enormous fun. And I show you how I make my own breakfast cereal, which has already drawn some ire and ridicule from the audience. <laughs> and in the next few days, I will post a video for the transition pictures of Cary Grant, the actor. He made so many movies. I went through his filmography and realized I'd only ever seen one of them, which was North by Northwest. But he's that suave, he's always called this suave, debonair guy everybody loved. And I wasn't really expecting expecting very much, and the pictures for his transition were bizarre. I also took a look at his handwriting. Uh, boy, there is way more to that guy than anybody really ever knew. So I will post that video in the next few days. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, now, of course, I did see, like everybody else, that uh, Kevin McCarthy is leaving Congress by the end of the year, throwing the Republican Party into turmoil. It only gives them a leeway of two votes in the House of Representatives. And if uh, somebody dies or somebody gets sick, they are really in trouble. Uh, but of course, the pitchers saw this all the way along. I don't want to go into everything, but remember when he was running for the speaker position and there was a road across a viaduct or a road down by the side of a viaduct. And he went down and down and down and eventually hid behind a pillar and cried. Uh, now, some of you said, what if the notches in the path, there were several notches down, and also the archways represent the speaker vote? It took 15 votes, I think, to get him in the chair in the first place. But usually the pictures play out over a much longer period of time. Timing is never easy with these things, but it usually doesn't play out in a day or two. And uh, this looked like a longer period of time. And sure enough, he uh, was forced out. And in fact, those pictures where he was trying to get into an elevator which was crowded, and somebody at the back of the elevator, which I said at the time was probably Matt Gates, said to him, there's no room for you here, we don't want you in here, and the doors closed, and he had to go down the stairs, and when he got to the bottom of the stairs, there was a curtain, and he was adjusting himself, getting ready to make a presentation, and when he went through the curtain, all the attention had been switched to somebody else which, of course, is what happened. He lost the uh, gavel and uh, the job went to Mike Johnson. Uh, 
But also, if you think about those pictures that I did where there was a handle like you get when you're water skiing behind a motorboat, and he grabbed it, which was when he took the speaker position, I suppose, and it immediately just dragged him through a field of mud. And he went blah, 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 and he splashed them all over him. And in the end, he sat up and he was just coated in mud and goo. It had been the most terrible time. And uh, that's exactly how his speakership went. There were those other pictures involving him and Matt Gates, where Gates eventually went off on some kind of ice flow, shaking his fist. I'll get you, Kevin McCarthy, you've not heard the last of me. Very fiendish, as he sailed away, suggesting that Kevin McCarthy might do something that would perhaps lose Matt Gates' seat or get him into deeper trouble. Well, it's turning out now that... Yeah, Kevin McCarthy had a bunch of super PAC money that he was going to use, I suppose, to get re-elected, which is not now going to happen. And so the rumor is that he is going to use that money to elect Republicans or get them into office in 2024. But here's the thing. He might put that money behind normal Republicans, normal, as opposed to MAGA Republicans. And so by funding the normal Republicans, he would squeeze out the MAGA Republicans who were so much trouble to him in the House as a kind of revenge, one of whom was Matt Gates. Uh, it's only a rumour that that's what he's going to do, but uh, that would be very, very interesting if so. Now, I did say that I wanted to take a look at Pat Harrigan, who's flown under the radar for a while, which is why you may not have heard of him. But he is a former Green Beret, served in Afghanistan for 18 months, and a West Point graduate, has a degree in nuclear engineering, so he's definitely no dummy. But he is a pro-Trump guy through and through, and now he's running for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives for the 14th Congressional District of North Carolina. The seat being vacated by Patrick McHenry. You remember him. He's the man who threw a tantrum in the house after his very, very good friend, Kevin McCarthy, lost the speaker's gavel. And McHenry had to stand in for a while until Mike Johnson was appointed. But uh, it turns out that Pat Harrigan, as well as having these political ambitions and being a former Green Beret, owns and runs a firearms company. And many other companies as well, all related to the military and the sale of guns and stuff. It used to be a hobby selling guns, and he turned it into this multi-million dollar business. But he makes rifles and guns and things, so he is another of those military people who is trying to get into Congress, which makes the rest of us think... Is there really a serious coup attempt here whereby you get enough military people into government and the lay people just basically go? Patrick McHenry resigns, other people go, and you're left with a bunch of soldiers running the country. I know that Tommy Tuberville, following what the pictures said, has agreed that over 400 military appointments can now go through. But you notice who he's held back on, 11 four-star generals, the people at the top. Why would he be doing that? Could it be because if in a year's time Trump does indeed get back into power, he can simply put his own generals in there. And those generals can get rid of, discharge, dismiss, whatever the technical term is, all the people that don't agree with Trump's policies who are underneath him or her. I don't know that he's doing that, but it certainly makes sense given the other military people who are running for office as well. So I thought I would take a look at Pat Harrigan's pictures to see whether he makes it into the US House of Representatives in 2024. And when I went into his energy, there he is, he was standing on a set of logs or rollers or something that weren't moving initially and then suddenly they were. It was almost like he got the go-ahead. McHenry's leaving. Now's your chance. He was mobilized 
and the rollers started going. It's like, oh, oh, we're off, we're off, we're off. And he plowed ahead. He was prime for this. He was eager to go. This guy has stamina. And there were the hills that represent the end of a year, usually the interface between this year and the next one. And most people just go over them. It's no big deal, but not him. He plowed through. He dug his own tunnel and burst out the other side. Boulders and rocks and rubble went everywhere. So the path ahead was pretty straight. Until about the summer, maybe May, June, July, when... Three, I think it was three, waves came. Very, very large, tidal wavy type things that would have scared anybody else but not Pat Harrigan. He just stood there. He was prepared for this. It's almost as if he knew they were coming. Some disturbance, some change, some upset or something. He knew at some level that this was coming and was prepared for it because of his training. And he just stood there. A real, strong, stable guy. So much so that instead of panicking, he just went over the first wave, then over the second wave, over the third wave, and was left standing. The fallout from this caused him to have to readjust. The plan only went so far, and then it called for a reassessment of tactics. The road he needed to be on was high up here. So he wasn't at that level yet. And what's more, he was kind of trapped in the overhang. There was no real way to get up there. He hadn't seen this coming. There was something about the plan that had an open end to it. At some point, he thought, OK, I won't climb up onto it this way. I'll go round the other way. And he kind of scrambled up a hill and onto the path. But this path was incredibly shaky and it tilted and staying on it for him was a bit like trying to surf through a tempest with the storm clouds and the waves. It was really, really hard. He struggled. He really thought he could make this. He was determined. He had the stamina. But as the road tilted, he kind of went down by his fingernails and fell off. So it's almost as if there was a crisis of some kind or an anticipated problem that he was more than equipped to deal with. And he stood strong throughout the whole thing. Yeah, I can deal with this. I spent 18 months in Afghanistan. I'm more than capable. But then the plan only went so far or his abilities only went so far or the situation only took him so far. And uh, when it all ended... In the summer, the fall, whenever it was, he was left looking at this high road going, yeah, but how am I going to get up there? He scrambled up, but he found out that the way ahead was nowhere near as secure or stable as he thought it was going to be. And I don't think that Pat Harrigan is going to make it into office in 2024. And by the way, I have absolutely no idea whether he is a part of the coup to plot. He could just be a very sincere Republican soldier who wants to run for office. It could simply be that. Uh, I, I also think that if there is such a thing as a coup to, and I'm not just making it up, but if there is such a thing and Tommy Tuberville is involved and Trump is involved or whatever, I don't think that succeeds either, certainly based on the pictures so far. <laughs> Uh, of course, Mike Johnson, the new Speaker of the House, was allegedly, apparently, according to Liz Cheney in her book, a part of the coup attempt last time in his way. And I thought, well, if that's the case, then surely Jack Smith has his eyes on Mike Johnson as part of his larger investigation into what went on on January the 6th. Uh, so I thought, I'll just take a quick look at the two of them, put them side by side. There they are to see how they interact. And when I did, Mike Johnson was very, very animated. He was all over the place, walking backwards and forwards. Meanwhile, Jack Smith was on top of a very, very high pillar. It was like a tall pillar with some kind of seat on top. And he was just sitting, surveying the landscape, watching what was going on keeping his eye on various different things, bigger picture guy, basically. 
What was fascinating about this was, though, that the sun was behind him. And the shadow of the tower, whilst he might be a long way away physically, the shadow of the tower crept across the landscape. And no matter where Mike Johnson went, no matter where he put his feet, he was in the shadow of this tower and couldn't get out of it. And I thought, oh, in that case, definitely there's some kind of surveillance going on of Mike Johnson, some kind of investigation going on behind the scenes. And Mike Johnson felt it. You know when you're in shadow on a sunny day, right? He felt that shadow. What was curious, though, about these pictures was that Mike Johnson seemed to have a way of eluding this shadow, eluding Jack Smith. There was some kind of edge, like a cliff edge thing, and he scurried over to it and went down, so he was no longer in the shadow and no longer in Jack Smith's eyeline. And then he just ran away. So I wonder whether he will ultimately step down from his post and you know, just disappear, just go somewhere, uh, take some new opportunity somewhere. And Jack Smith goes, well, we could pursue him. But on the other hand, there are all these other people we've got to focus on, the main perpetrators. We'll just let him go. Let him go and do his thing rather than have the spectacle of indicting a Speaker of the House or former Speaker of the House. Let's let him go. And that's how that works out. But it does seem from the pictures that based on today's energy anyway, Jack Smith knows what's going on, sees Mike Johnson. He's definitely on the radar. Mike Johnson feels the heat a little, but ultimately clambers down out of the way and escapes. Well, this was my opportunity to project forward. I love these time travel things. Ever since I did the transition pictures for Nostradamus, do you ever see those? I'll see if I can root it out and I'll put a link in the show notes down below. Because um, obviously, Nostradamus was famous for his prophecies, for his predictions, many of which are said to have come true. And when I did the pictures for him, it seemed that he had discovered a way to astral travel, to play around with time itself and to figure out how to go forward and backwards by using the energies of the universe. Very, very fascinating. And uh, uh, I think a lot of us were mind boggled by those. But I thought, let's see if we can do that. For Trump, first of all, and then for the USA. Project forward, time travel forward to January 2025. Let's see how I feel in that energy. So Trump first, there he is. And when I went into that energy for January 2025, there were the hills. Remember the hills, like the interface between two years. And on the other side of it, the shadow side, Trump was sliding down on his front. He was going backwards, actually, didn't know where he was going. And the gravel, the stones of the hill, were scraping his face. It felt incredibly uncomfortable. Now, it's not impossible, I suppose, that he's actually in the earth by 2025. Maybe. But it also felt like anything but victory. It felt like a slump. It felt like disappointment. It felt really, really rough. Like you land on your face and then you slide down and get scratched and criticized and humiliated and your plans all go wrong. It felt like that. So I did the USA in January 2025. And this ties in with the pictures I saw for... Pat Harrigan and all those other soldiers, former soldiers, that I've done in the past. Because when I went scooting across the landscape of 2024 towards the election, the ground around the fall, late summer fall, seemed to be on fire. Now, these pictures obviously are metaphorical. It could just be the pressure leading up to the election. 
It could be something happens in the world that adds to the uh, uncertainty of everything. Who knows what this is, but it's not literal. America is not on fire. Uh, but there were these flames, and it felt like a time of pressure, of concern, of not being sure how things would turn out. There was smoke and everything. Maybe something happens in Russia or China or whatever, and it affects life in America. But something causes, I think, those waves in Pat Harrigan's pictures. Whether it's accidental, deliberate, or whatever, I don't know. Then came the election. Then came the hill. On the other side of the hill, January 2025, the ground was covered with ash. This was fallout from the fire, from the smoke. It had landed here from the fear, the anxiety, the battle, or whatever else had gone on. This is going to be a tense election, obviously. Uh, but the ash was all there, and it was moving. It was a vibrant thing. It was like the ash on the side of a volcano. It was moving downwards into some kind of underground space, cavern, whatever it was. There was a lot to go in there. Meanwhile, the US had found a slope up. Slopes usually mean challenges. So maybe there are election challenges or stuff like that to sort out. But once they had been sorted out and once the ash, the flow of it, had gone into that underground space, that cavern, whatever it was, America was on a higher path and could continue on in a much better, freer, happier frame of mind. The only thing to remember, that's good news, right? <laughs> but the only thing to remember was that the ash had simply gone underground. Even if America manages to defeat whatever had caused the fire, to subdue it, to put it out, there would always be this flow of ash, resentment, uh, distrust, whatever it might be, that would continue underground. Meanwhile, though, everything was a lot brighter and sunnier and uh, full of relief on the general US front. So it does look, based on today's pictures, as though whatever tensions are created uh, next summer, fall or whatever, it all resolves itself in a very positive way. And this is just the heat of democracy establishing itself in a new way. And the forces who are against democracy somehow have to be voted out or not voted in in the first place. Remember those pictures I did for democracy where it was like written on the side of a high stone wall and there was a big black cloud moving towards it. And this black cloud, with all the little feet inside it, tried to knock down the wall and get in. And I said, you don't want those people in your castle. But if they get in, they will stay in. Once they're in, they're in. I said this over and over and over again. And now they're trying again in 2024. Only I think they're a little bit more organised this time, a little bit more clued up, a little bit more wary. But it does look as though once all the wrinkles have been ironed out and all these people have been dealt with, that once you're into February, March 2025, things are a lot brighter and more hopeful for the United States of America. So that's good. <laughs> all right, that's all I got for you. Thanks a lot, guys, for watching. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.